Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you got yourselves all nice and settled in. We are in conversation number three from our teaching series on the small town church. This series was built around the desire for us, especially in this season, to make sure we understand what church is for and why, from a personal level all the way to looking at the entire kingdom of God. And so conversation number one was very personal. It was looking about you, looking at you and how you relate to what the church is supposed to be and what it's supposed to be doing. And so we looked at how in that first conversation, God is all about in the business of changing who we are into the likeness of Jesus. So we are ready to represent his church well. And that matters wherever you go, but I think it matters a great deal in small town churches too. Places that often have all of that credibility and reputation based on the actions, behaviors of the people who call that church home. The second conversation that we had was getting a little bit bigger, looking about the the interdependent network of people at the church that we call family. These people that we actually grow to love and cherish and depend on and how God has always been wanting to build a certain type of church. And it is our goal to make sure that we don't give us a fake representation of that, that we don't put up for, we don't settle with anything less than the most beautiful expression of brothers and sisters in Christ coming together. Now today, like I said, is conversation number three. Today, we're going to talk about why the church continues to exist beyond that. Above and beyond the nice family getting together, why does the church draw breath? Why does the church sometimes do some seemingly crazy things? What is its purpose, its intent, and its mission? We're going to have a conversation about that and about how we play a part in that. And one of the things that we love to do at Epiphany is we love to gather stories and testimonies of people who call Epiphany Station home. We have one of those for you right now that we're going to share from Myrna Lane, who is one of the oldest parts of our church family and who made the transition to Epiphany Station a few years ago. And here is her sharing about what that looked like for her. Hi, my name is Myrna Lane, and I'm here today to explain that why I want to be part of a church. The reason I started coming to Epiphany Station was my sister, who lives in Columbus, Indiana. Um, why don't you come to Epiphany Station? I said, where's Epiphany Station? And the music was a little loud. I said, do you want some earplugs? No. And, and if you can't stand the whole time, sit down. I just got hooked. And I thought, oh my God. That's what church is supposed to be like. Not about fancy decorations and fancy buildings and all of this. I can't even explain the feeling. It was just, this is, this is what love God and love people. We're closing with the Lord's Prayer. I miss that, I still kind of do, because it kind of leaves you with an inner peace and then you go out and shake hands and hug and whatever. So, and I still miss that. Like the Kyrie and the, and the liturgy, everything was such a format, and this format was completely different. And I, I kind of didn't even miss that very long. I just kind of fell into the flow of things. But yeah, closing with the Lord's Prayer, I, th- yes. I kind of missed that, and still kind of do, but. Whatever, I can say it to myself anytime I want. (laughs) I talk to God all day. And I'm the oldest wherever I go. I'm the third oldest here. Uh, 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 Bonnie Van Skoik in Everett Langlet, who I graduated with, but he's a year older than me. Bonnie's the oldest, then it's Everett, then it's me. Well, I thought, does that bother me? Nah. So what, I'm alive, one foot goes ahead of the other, I'm here. So the things that were important when I was younger or even church-wise are not anymore. It's just trying to live God's word and being the best disciple I can be and I fall short every day. But you gotta keep trying. I call this my home church because I get a different vibe, a different feeling. I feel part of everybody and certainly part of God's Word, which that's what church is about to me. It isn't the building, it isn't the fancy windows, it isn't the cross, it isn't all the extra stuff that goes with fancy churches. It's about people and loving God. My name is Myrna and I am part of the mission of God.
Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank Myrna for being willing to share that with everyone. Um, we um, often gather those stories together just to make sure that we actually, as the Epiphany Station, we understand why people choose to be here. Because a lot of things that maybe aren't preference, aren't what they prefer, but there's a lot of things about keeping the mission as simple as we can that helps people get on that mission about what we're a part of. What we're trying to understand during this teaching series in Ephesians 2, verses, 9 through, uh, verses 19 through 22, is a, a chunk of Scripture that helps us understand what God is really doing in Scripture and what He's trying to tell us about the church. This is what God has to say. He says that the kingdom, this kingdom of faith, is now your home country. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone else. God is building, he is using, he is irrespective of how you got here, wanting to build us into the church. He used the apostles and the prophets as a foundation, and now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day by day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. And so when we understand why we get together, why we do what we do, and why we do church, it's important for us to understand that maybe we don't fully understand why we get together and why we do church. Maybe there are misconceptions held through experience. Like, let's be honest about it. Some people see what we do as church as some sort of long-running joke, like this long-running farce that doesn't really even seem to gel well with postmodern thinking and society. There are yet others who think church is a place you go so you can be with other people who are against all the other people that don't come to your church. You know those people. They vote differently. They think differently. They, they worship differently. And yet few others, there's a few others out there that think the church is just a big scam, a way to get your money. Quite frankly, they're all completely wrong. But what we should be willing to entertain as the church is if they can be so wrong about the church, what stops us being wrong? What stops us from maybe just having a narrow experience of church and not being able to fully understand it? Maybe a bad experience, maybe even an abusive experience. What stops us from becoming forgetful or complacent around the original intent of church? And so all I'm going to promise you that we're going to do today over the next 15 minutes is we're going to leave here knowing a little bit more about what God's original intent for the church was so we can make sure we make it our intent. If you ask anyone who gets to make decisions in the church, you'll get a variety of answers, but the big answer that should come home eventually is Jesus gets to tell the church what the church is supposed to do. And so we can find in lots of places where Jesus gives the church instruction because he gets to own it. He gets to own it because he came for it to earth and he died for it and he was resurrected for it. And so after Jesus' resurrection, we see a chunk of instruction that he gives to the church, about the church, and for the church. We see it in the last few verses of Matthew, which is a book. It's a narrative written about the life of Jesus. And we see in that this chunk at the end that's come to be known as the Great Commission. It says that Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commandments I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, you might have heard that before. You might have heard that a thousand times. This is maybe the first time you heard that. But that, that right there is the call to the church. That's the marching orders that we were given by our commander-in-chief of what the church is now supposed to do. And those haven't changed ever. All the work the church has ever done, all the work of mercy, all the work of grace, all the work of evangelism, all the salvations, all the baptisms, all the new life that the church has brought to people, and all the screw-ups it's made, all of that is based on the efforts they've had put behind understanding this charge from Jesus. How do we go and make disciples? And sometimes it's done it right, and sometimes it's done it wrong. But you see, when Jesus said, go and make disciples, he implied something in there. When Matthew was writing this all down, he wrote it in Greek, and the Greek word for going, to go and make, 
is the word tari o mai. And tari o mai, not just meaning go as in, you know, have an attitude in which you'll eventually get there. It's like pick up everything you've got and move now. Like travel now from where you are to a different location. Go make disciples. It gives the church this, this identity of a mobile entity that we're supposed to always be moving as a church into that place where we're making disciples. And if we're not, we need to question why we're not. Because if a church isn't making disciples, if it isn't bringing people to Jesus and baptizing them and teaching them how to obey him, we have to ask, is it church? Can it be church if it's not doing what church does? And here's the harder question for you to ask yourself. If we don't play an active part, if I don't, if you don't play an active part in making disciples and baptizing them and teaching them to obey the commandments, are we church? Am I church? I think if Jesus came and he asked and he looked, I think we would sometimes feel a little bit uncomfortable about how much we maybe direct a lot of our attention and effort elsewhere other than making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them. If we were to look closely at our church, the place we call home, you look closely at Epiphany and you get scrutinized and you get some critical eyes on you, are we missing something? Are we potentially forgotten something about why we do what we do? Because I think there's a potential for us to do that. There was a time, a beautiful time, in which Jesus was walking with his disciples in which he gave a call to action of the church, but he also gave the very reason, the reason we can't afford to forget for doing ministry, for doing church. It said that Jesus traveled, this is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, though, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, when Jesus sees people without Jesus, when he sees them outside of God's family, the thing that drove Jesus, that drove him to a ministry of healing and teaching and eventually dying for people, what drove him to what his mission was a heart of compassion. It was looking at people who don't have what they most need and feeling it, feeling the pain of not having it. And that, quite frankly, is what has driven every God-inspired move of the church for the last 2,000 years. Every time that the gospel has traveled to a new area, every time we've opened an orphanage or a hospital or staffed a university, every time that we've met an individual's physical needs, relational needs, and spiritual needs, it has been out of a heart of compassion. It has been out of a place of wanting to give to others what we have received. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that church only does well. It only does what it's supposed to do. It only ever grows and it only ever multiplies when the motivation of the people inside is compassion. See, coolness, coolness wears off. Newness goes away with time. And leadership will never lead the church toward compassion. What changes in a church when a church does what it's called to do is when the individual people actually go straight to Jesus and see what Jesus saw, when they feel what Jesus felt. So here's the tough question for you. It's a real tough one. How do you feel about people? Like not the people that you like and you're okay with and you hang out with. How do you feel about people you don't? Like if your church... How do you feel about the people outside of your church? How does your church as a whole family feel about the people outside? Is it one of compassion, a desire for them to experience what you have? Or maybe do we see people who wander in our doors a bit scruffy as a burden? Maybe do we see people who seemingly are against us or think different than us as a threat? Or do we just see it as annoying that they won't fall into line? I think those are some of the easiest feelings to have about people we disagree with. Because it's easy for us to forget. It's very easy for you and I to forget that we once belonged to that group of people outside the church, outside the family of God. We were drawn in not by our own skills, talents, or worthiness, but because just Jesus wanted to. It's very easy for us to forget that those people out there that aren't part of our church families, they're not the enemy. They're not the problem. They're not what we need to fight and argue against. It's very easy for us to become distracted. 
I think the mission of the church is very much like life goals. You know, when you, like, you think about your life, and maybe you have one of those like, deep moments, like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And you set up this list. This is who I'm going to be. This is how I'm going to act. This is what I'm going to accomplish and what I'm going to achieve. But then like in a few maybe days, weeks, or if you're myself, hours, you realize actually you're not putting much of, into that at all. And that's no longer become your sole focus. Like I think it's very easy when life happens, when you get tired or you get stressed and you get hungry and you stop doing the things you know you should do for the things that just are easier, more comfortable. Like, let's look at the COVID-19 season, shall we? Let's be honest, there were a lot of us two months ago who were saying a lot of things about, if only I had more time. Like, there's a lot of things that you're thinking to yourself right now, and you turn to your spouse, and you're looking, and you're thinking, yeah, we said that. If only I had more time at home. If I only had more time with my spouse. If I had more time with the kids. If I had more time, I would eat better. And I would work out. If I had more time, I would cook more. I would clean more. I would study more. And turns out, that's not true. Turns out, when we actually get more time on our hands, we tend not to use it most productively. Like TikTok users, they doubled in the first two weeks. Video game sales went 30% through the roof in the first month. And Netflix has never been watched so much. And many of you know more now about how not to take care of tigers than you ever thought you would ever need to know. You see, life goals and things that are genuinely important to you, it just doesn't just happen. It doesn't fall at your feet or get dished up on a plate. It happens when you prioritize it. It's not our default to do difficult, challenging things. And it's the same with the mission of the church. It's very easy for us to get started, and we're all about bringing people to Jesus. We're all about not me, but them. But then we get tired. Quite frankly, we often just get compassion fatigue because it's work and it's difficult. Sometimes we set up some excuses like, you know, after I, after I graduate, I'll get more involved in the mission of the church, or after I get married, maybe, and maybe after I've done raising the kids and they're out the house, maybe after I retire. All of these things we can come up with of, I'll get about that business when I've got time for that business. Truth be told, when it comes to the mission of the church, what we don't need is more time. We don't need more money, and we don't need to find just the right church to fit into. What we actually need is compassion. What we actually need is what Jesus felt and feels for those people not in our church families. To have feelings for them beyond annoyance and burden and stress. Instead, seeing what's missing from their lives and what they could have. You see, when Jesus looked at crowds, he saw what was true. He saw them leaderless, and he had compassion. He was lost and confused, sheep without a shepherd. He saw what they needed most. It's very easy for us to go our entire lives, and I mean your entire life, the rest of your days, worrying about stuff, stuff that's just really not that important. But when we feel the compassion of Jesus, stuff starts to change. You might be part of a church or have been part of a church or been right, right now thinking about Epiphany Station and quite frankly, you're not thinking about the mission of the church. It's the easiest thing in the world, so don't let me, let me feel like I'm giving you a hard time here. It's the easiest thing in the world for us to get distracted by preferences. Preferences of what we think we might like instead. We get into debates at church about what color is most reverent for the carpet and, and what song should and should not be sung, and which translation of the Bible was the best one, and all these distractions, things that genuinely need to be decided upon but really shouldn't take the energy we put into them. One of the things that I've loved about being a part of Epiphany Station for nigh on a decade and being able to lead it for the past four is the people of Epiphany Station that I've experienced somehow seem to be able to put some of their preferences to one side. Like we heard from Myrna Lane. Myrna, Myrna's old school and she'd tell you that. There's some of the things about church that she was always used to doing it a certain way. And when she first came to Epiphany, she'd come up to me and say, I'd really like it if we did such and such. And which I'd say, look, that's, that's not what we're going to do right now. And to that, some people leave. But there are others who will take their preferences and they'll put them on the sideline when they see that they're part of a church family that's getting stuff done. That they're a part of a place that is not built for them. It's actually built for those who aren't here yet. And so the church that you might be a part of, might have been a part of, had all sorts of methods. 
It has methods like music and how they did the messages and then the worship and the benevolence and all these things of small groups and ministries. The truth of the matter is those are just methods. And every method should only serve the mission of seeing people come to know Jesus, be baptized and taught how to obey him. If we're serious, if you ever count yourself serious about what Jesus said about bringing people into the church, then it needs a heart of compassion. And if you have a heart of compassion, it becomes much, much easier to get serious about what Jesus had to say. We must not forget that we are the place that God decided to put a message of hope, to give it to us so that we would go and share it with those who most desperately need it. And we live in a season where people are looking like no other. And so it's our time to play our part in telling people about Jesus. What I want to leave you with today is two very distinct challenges. Like they're real opportunities for something that you could do if you're serious about telling people about Jesus. Things that you could do this week, in fact, that connect your heart to the mission of the church. The first comes on the back end of Matthew 9, in that chunk in which Jesus is looking at the crowds. And as he looks at the crowds, he has compassion on them because they're lost and confused. He sees that they're sheep without a shepherd, and he immediately turns to his disciples. He says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Here's the first challenge that I have for you. The first thing that I'm going to ask you to do this week, to not shirk and not shake off, if you're serious about making disciples, is to pray that people would do the work of the church. And here's the qualifier. If you are the church, like you consider yourself the church, I want you to pray for you. I want you to pray about you. I want you to pray that God would bring you onto the mission. I want you to pray that God would make opportunities for you to be able to tell other people about Jesus. That when he sends you somewhere, you would respond and go. And that your heart would become compassionate toward the people. You would have genuine compassion on why they are so broken, so lost, so angry, so frustrated. That you would become a beacon of mercy and grace and boldness. That you would receive the God-given gusto to go up and talk to someone this week about your faith in Jesus. I want you to pray for this thing this week. I want you to pray on the daily, pray at dinner time, I don't care, but pray that God would change your heart and your motivations so you would be ready to go and do the work. The second thing that I'm going to challenge you to do, alongside praying that the work would get done by you, is for you to take a step in what the church has been doing for generations. It's all centered around why there's any kind of hierarchy or leadership structure in a church whatsoever. Like, why are there pastors? Why are there staff? Why are there coaches? Because their goal, their purpose and responsibility is to work with you, equip you to go and do the work of the church. What we see in this is that from Ephesians, it says that these are the gifts that Christ has given to the church. He's given to the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, but their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, which is the body of Christ. That's their job. And so what I'm going to ask you to do this week is a challenge, don't get me wrong, but the challenge is for you to go ask those in leadership, how can I build up the church? What can I do? to help find out what your skill set is, what your passion is, what your gifts are, so you can get about the business of the church's mission. Go wherever you are, wherever you call church home, and ask the question. It takes guts, but do it. If Epiphany Station is your home, then I want you to do something that's very, very specific, even if it's not your home, but specifically if it is. Because I have a specific time for you to do this. I have a day and a time that I want you to go and ask the question of your church leadership here at Epiphany, how can I build up the church? Tomorrow at 6 p.m., I want you to be on a Zoom call and attend Mission 101, which is a training discipleship class. It is built, it was created by Alan and Naomi Zach, a couple of our ministry coaches, our leadership here at Epiphany, for those who want to be about the business of the mission, those who are ready to do the work. And you might go and it takes about an hour and you'll be there and you might get a little bit from it of how to do what you do in the church. 
it also might turn your whole world upside down as they spend the time equipping you. Now, I want to be honest with you, something that I appreciate and I know about you and about me, we don't like doing stuff. We especially don't like doing stuff people tell us to do. And when I said, I want you to attend Mission 101 tomorrow night at 6 p.m., you said, I'm not doing that. You might have said it out loud if you're bold. I'm not in front of you. You could have gotten away with that. You might have said it in your head. But the reason I'm challenging you to do this, to think back on this and to debate actually on this, is because I don't know of a more practical step you could take. If you are serious about making disciples... And someone came up to you and said, actually, there's a thing you can go to that will help you make disciples. How many reasons could we come up with not to go to that, not to do that? So your challenge is simple, is not if you're going to pray and if you're going to go to mission one. Your challenge is this, do I really care? Do I have the compassion necessary for the people outside the church to do something about it, to pray about it, for my heart to be changed, for opportunities to be given? Do I have the compassion to be willing to be equipped to do what I'm called to do? The church continues, it exists, God continues to breathe life, and Jesus continues to lead it for one reason and one reason alone, to use us. Our core text says that he's using you Fitting you together, brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone, holding everything together. We see it taking shape day by day. A temple built by God, all of us built into it. A place where God wants to be, where God is quite at home. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. It's the part of being a church that I know you want to be a part of. It's a church that God has called us to be, and it's the church that they need us to be. That every day we would be taking shape. Every day a little bit more of be would be a little bit more about the mission of the church. So the challenge for you is simple. Do you see your place, your part in the church? Do you see how you're a brick and a stone being built up into this beautiful structure in which more people get to come in and have a relationship with our God? That's the kind of church where I want to belong. That's the kind of thing that small town church is called to do. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you that you give us such a clear calling of responsibility for those of us who know and believe you and believe Jesus to be Savior and King, that we don't need to debate and argue about what our mission is. You've made it clear. You've given us a great commission above and beyond everything else we could ever put time to. So God, help us, first of all, to have a compassion to do that. Not to have the anger to do that, the fire to do that, the frustration to do that, but the compassion to be about making other people into disciples. God, help us to not be distracted by all the other things we could be doing, all the side things that we could put our lives into. Help us instead find our place where we can get to work in what you've been doing for generations and millennia, bringing people into the family. Help us to be that kind of church. Help me to be that kind of person and to do the things that will move more of my life, shaping me day by day into it. God, we ask you to help us do that, turn us into that, help us to be your church. In Jesus' name.